morning, Mr. Randall. Good morning. Mr. Maxson. Mr. Vanderlyn is waiting in the study. Thank you. Hello, Van. Just got your message a few minutes ago. Hello, Mr. Randall. Maxson, I'm sorry to ask you over this early in the morning, but I'm leaving town at noon, and I thought it might be a good chance to check up on a few things. It certainly is, Van, because we just worked out the final plans for the architect. That's fine. And if you'll notice, we even found a way of converting the roof garden into a landing field for helicopters. Oh. We'll be the only yacht club in the world with anything like it. We had a new application for membership this morning, too. Colonel Rittenhouse. The British intelligence? <laughs> well, even the British intelligence has to relax. You know him, don't you, Rick? A shipboard acquaintance. I cross with him on the Queen Elizabeth. Hmm. How many memberships have we sold so far? Oh, I don't know exactly, but I'd In say... In money, I mean. Well, I think it's about 250000 isn't it, Rick? What about that? Mostly my friends, aren't they? Well, we have tried to limit this to the right people. Something strange happened last night. I don't know how to explain it. What is it, Van? You remember this picture you gave me, showing you and the Count aboard his yacht? Of course I remember. I showed it to a friend of mine. This morning, he brought over this one. I thought it was a rather remarkable coincidence, so I examined both pictures under a microscope. The cloud formations are identical. In fact, all the details are the same, except that you're in one picture and you're not in the other. Well, my snap was taken in a Havana van. Details and cloud formations to the contrary. So stop worrying. I'm not a ghost. I hope you're not a ghost, Randall. I hope you're who you say you are because it would have been an easy matter to slip this negative out of the newspaper files long enough to have a reprint made, a reprint superimposing your picture. Just what are you implying, Van? I never bothered to check on you, Randall. I took your word as to who you were, what you were. Oh, it never occurred to me to pass out credentials, possibly because no one has ever questioned my word before. I'm sorry, Randall, but you must remember my position. I've gone into this yacht club deal whole hog. Advise my friends to do so, too. Now there's a quarter of a million dollars involved, and we've nothing more to show than an option on a piece of shoreline than this blueprint. I've heard of confidence men before. C confidence men? <laughs> That's a very serious charge, Van. I'm only asking for an explanation, gentlemen. Which I don't think we should be put in the position of having to give. But since there's some doubt, I suggest that you put in a call to the Count at once. I already did, Mr. Randall, this morning. He left for Europe a month ago. That's why I'm asking you for some sort of explanation. I don't think you're going to get one, Van. In that case, you leave me no other choice but to call the police. All right, have it your way. Bring on the cops and let them tag all of us. What do you mean, all of us? Aren't you one of our partners? I was hoodwinked into signing that contract. Couldn't tell it by your handwriting. This is a fraud. I'll get the best lawyer in the country. And the worst kind of publicity. Let's face it, Van. A messy trial involving a man of your reputation had caused quite a scandal. I'm not going to stand by and allow my friends to be fleeced by a gang of... Confidence You don't have to stand by, Van. Call up your friends and tell them the plans for the Yacht Club were a little premature. They've been indefinitely postponed. What about the money they invested? We're partners, remember? We took it in, you give it back. You mean pay them back with my money? What's the matter? Is it counterfeit? Simple business law, Van. A partner's responsible for the actions of his associates. You don't have a paragraph to stand on. Get out. Get out of here, both of you. You won't be needing these anymore. Get out of here before I throw you out. Hello, boys. Sit down. All right. Tori, fix the boys a drink. When do we leave? After we talk over our next move. Maybe we ought to lay low for a while. Sookie doesn't believe in unemployment, Rick. It's the root of all evil. Funny, I thought women were. Take in a movie, baby. We've got some business. I'll stay here and be real quiet. There's a good bill at the Paradise. I'll pick you up later. One of these days, you're going to lose me to an usher. Drafty out here, isn't it? Hello, Max. Glad to see you back. How's California? Like Florida? Only people live there all year round. That smog is rough on my sinus. 
I didn't send you out there for your health, Max. Tell them about the town I asked you to look over. Wasn't bad. Lots of moneyed people, but mostly hoarders. Very few spenders. Sounds like L.A. L.A. The town's Mission City. Mission City? A little haven of retired millionaires, just outside of Pasadena. Hasn't been touched yet. Maybe there's a reason. Could be the city fathers are too tough to handle. It doesn't matter. Since when? Since I decided the city manager's going to cover for us. Oh, ambitious, I don't know. That's practical. The old boy's got a daughter he's nuts about. We involve her in a little fraud game. He can't expose us without exposing her. Simple? Until you try involving the girl, then maybe it's not so simple. Well, that's where you fit in, Rick. Unless, of course, you've lost that fatal charm of yours. I haven't had any complaints lately. Her name is Deborah Owens Clark, 24 years old, strictly respectable. Lost her husband in the war and still hasn't gotten over it. In that frame of mind, she's a perfect mark for you. What's the fix? The same kind of a game we played with Vandalin. Only this time, instead of raising money for a yacht club, we do it for a phony war memorial. A phony war memorial? That's a very patriotic idea. The details are all in this envelope. You and Duke memorize the stuff. You're leaving tomorrow morning. Well, in that case, we'd better go and pack. Well, you're big enough now to sit on a suitcase by yourself, Duke. I want to talk to Rick alone. Take a walk, Max. It's good for your health. What's up? I just thought you'd like to know that Tori won't be with us for a while. I'm sending her to Havana. She'll like it there. That's what the travel folders say. But somehow I have an idea she prefers you to a Cuban rumba. Suki, don't let your imagination run away with you. She's your girl. If you don't trust her, get rid of her. It's a funny thing, Rick. Tori's like a high tension wire. Once you grab on, you can't let go. Even if you want to. And I don't want to. I like Tori. I like her a lot. Well, I hope you both will be very happy. But leave me out of it. That's the way I'd like it, too. I'm going to double your take if you make good in California. You're generous. Very generous. But only with money. There isn't any hurry, Duke. We're not leaving till tomorrow. Hello, lover. You're not very bright, are you? Maybe not, but I've got a certain kind of exciting beauty. Anyone see you come in? The bellboy, and he whistled. What happened to the movie? It was after six. They raised the price of admission. Silky just had a talk with me. Oh? About you. I hope you didn't let him bandy my good name about. Got to take it easy, Tori. Silky's suspicious enough as it is. Worry, worry, worry. I don't know how you manage to keep looking so young. You know, we haven't seen much of you lately. Use your head, Tori. We can't afford to take chances now. Oh, come on. Let's take some chances. After this next deal, I'm breaking away. I'm as fed up with Silky as you are. Then tell me where he's going to send you. He hasn't told me yet. You know, if you weren't so good looking, I'd take your face apart for lying to me. I don't want you around, baby. This could be my big chance. After that, I'll send for you. Where am I going to be? I don't know, but I'll find you. He's sending me to Havana, and you know it. Cut it out, Tori. I don't like your attitude, mister. You know things you're not telling me. I'll tell you what I want, no more. What's this? None of your business. Give me the picture. Who is she? My kid sister. You're lying again. If that's your kid sister, I'm a boa constrictor with high heels. All right, so you're a boa constrictor with high heels. Now give me the picture. No. No. If I didn't love you so much, Rick, I'd kill you. Stop twisting my arm. People will think we're married. I don't like the way you act in company. Let go, I'll reform. I'll be down in the bar. Scared of me, Duke? Frankly, yes.
When are you gonna learn to behave yourself? Not really, Rick. What would you do with a girl who behaved herself? Place my watch again. I was sure I put it right here by this jujitsu manual. I think it's hanging on the file there. Oh, what do you know? Right under my very nose. Thank you. <laughs> Ought to put it in a safety vault, I guess. It's a it's a family heirloom. It's got a lot of real diamonds in it. Hmm. I'd like a single room, please. Oh, a single, huh? Let me see. I can't give you a single. I got a double. You you don't happen to have a friend? No, I'm in town alone. You, uh, you here for the Rose Bowl game next week? No. I promised a buddy of mine if I ever got by this way, I'd drop in and see his family. <laughs> Who's that? A fellow named Jim Clark. Jim Clark? Did you know him? Yeah. We were together overseas up until the time he was killed. Why? Why, why he was one of my boys. <laughs> What'd you say your name was? Rick Stewart. I'm Charlie Jordan, secretary of the YAA. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Jordan. Oh, none of the Mr. stuff around here. And no last names, either. I'm just plain Charlie to all my boys. Okay, Charlie. Sure, I got a room for you, Rick. Any friend of Jim's. A nice big double one. Uh, all yourself. Here, just sign there. I'll get those, Charlie. Oh, not on your life. You just follow me. I guess you're going to see Deb. Well, I sort of promised Jim. I thought I'd call her tomorrow. Oh, Deb's a wonderful girl. Of course, she hasn't been any too well the last three years. Ever since Jim... Took it pretty hard, huh? Well, we all did. But Deb, most of all. Then maybe I'd better not. Oh, yeah. She'll want to see you. She'll want to see any friend of Jim's. Hiya, Charlie. Hello, fellas. Now I can't find my keys. I'm sure I brought them with me. Maybe if you jump up and down a little bit, they'll jingle. That's an idea. Hey. Worked like a charm. <laughs> well, here we are. How do you like it? Just like the Ritz Biltmore. Nothing too good for any friend of Jim's. <laughs> Say, Rick, hmm? we're having our boys' club meeting down at the gym tonight. Why don't you come down and tell the boys about your experiences? Uh, Jim used to be a leader in the YAA, I understand, and, uh, Charlie, but you know how most of the fellows feel about talking about their war experiences. You don't have to talk about the war, Rick. Talk about anything you like. Maybe something about courage or honesty. Okay, Charlie. I'll say something about honesty. Thanks. Just well to have you with us, son. See you later. I forgot my keys.
time for our guest speaker. Will you introduce him, Charlie? Boys, I don't think Rick Stewart really needs any introduction. He was a friend of Jim Clark's. He was with our Jim when, when, well, anyway, he isn't going to make a very long speech. I couldn't get him to do that. Even if I promised him, I wouldn't sing tonight. <laughs> However, he is going to say a few words to me. I think maybe a few very important words. Boys, Rick Stewart. Fellas, I'm not going to talk about the war tonight. It's old stuff. Besides, if I were to stand up here and blab about experiences at Okinawa or any place else, I'd consider myself a pretty corny guy. There's only one battle worth fighting nowadays. That's the battle for the peace. The battle to see if we can live together without fear, without fighting, and without sacrifice of our loved ones. This is the front line now. There are no uniforms, no bullets, no purple hearts. Just an obligation to those who died that we may live in peace. Jim Clark used to carry a poem around that said it a lot better than I can. They cannot win the peace, our silent dead. They only won the war. To those who live, the duty goes to echo what 10,000 graves have said and cannot now reset. It's up to us now, fellas, to carry on for guys like Jim, to arm ourselves with the one weapon that the enemies of truth cannot prevail against, honesty. Honesty means truth, and nothing in the world can lick it. That's what we ask you who came back from the last war. Honesty with yourselves, honesty with each other, and a determined fight for peace. Are you willing to take up that fight? Isn't that a wonderful speech, Deb? Oh, Mr. Stewart. I'm Jim's wife. I should have known. Charlie called and told me you were in town. Well, I figured this would be as good a time as any for you two to get together. That was a very nice speech, Mr. Stewart. Thank you. No, Deb. None of that Mr. and Mrs. stuff around here. This is Rick. Rick, this is Deb. I guess you two have a lot to talk about. Why don't you go for a drive somewhere? I have a car outside. Say goodbye to the boys for me, will you, Charlie? I sure will. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for everything. Oh, by the way, Charlie, one of the kids gave me this and asked me to give it back to you. <gasps> My watch? Gee, I, I missed it this afternoon. I wouldn't be too curious about who took it, Charlie. I think the boy's sorry. I guess you surely must have gotten to him, Rick. Thanks again. So long. So long. Edge of the world. Look down, see half the city. Look up, see half the universe. Jim and I used to come here when we wanted to talk. Cigarette? No, thanks. It's funny Jim never mentioned you in his letters. We never really got to know each other till the last few days. Were you with him when he died? No. We got separated when we hit the beach. I didn't hear about it myself for two days. Haven't any of the other boys been around to see you? I received a few letters, but nobody seemed to know how it happened. Sorry I can't help, Deb. I do know one thing, however. You were the last person on his mind before he went into battle. Did he? That is, he, he didn't happen to. Don't say anything. Yes, he did. We were standing on the rail of an LST heading to the breakers. 
He had a kind of a funny smile on his face, as if he were listening to something other than the barrage the Navy was laying in. Ricky said, you know how I feel about Deb. If you get through and I don't, drop in and see her sometime. I'd like to be sure that she goes on doing things for both of us. I want to know everything now, Rick, about those last few days. What Jim did, what he said. Well, mostly he was talking about you and passing your picture around. Which picture, Rick? A snapshot, I think, of the two of you. Oh, oh that one. He had a much better one of me alone. In a Mother Hubbard? No, oh, in a bathing suit. I guess he kept that one for himself. What else do you remember about him? Well, next to you, he's always talking about kids. How there were no bad kids, only bad breaks. Isn't that just like Jim? Always trying to help kids. Yeah, if he told me once, he told me a thousand times how he planned to build a youth center in town. Something big and comprehensive. Libraries, swimming pools, hobby rooms, all under one roof. Sounded kind of far-fetched at first. No, it's a wonderful idea. But why didn't he ever tell me about it? Or write it in his letters? Well, maybe he was sort of saving it for when he got back. In California, we better head back to town. But there's so much to talk about. Can't we stay here a little longer? I'll still be around tomorrow. May I see you then? Of course. You must be a mind reader. Maybe I am. Don't tell me there's a brain in that beautiful body. I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Saw you come out of the YAA. You don't look like the type they usually get there. I'm a spy. We're trying to find out what the reward for clean living is. Bet you're loads of fun on the date. You intending to find out? Maybe you wouldn't be interested in a man that's only worth six million dollars. I could learn to skimp. I'm free after seven. Oh, Rick, I was afraid I'd missed you. I never go anyplace without a morning cup of coffee. May I talk to you alone? Of course, sir. Uh, heat that up for me, will you please? How much? you? No, thanks. Bring it over here. Sure. Guess where I've been all morning. I give up. Down at the library. Did you know that 12% of all murderers, 28% of all burglars, and 26% of all thieves apprehended were under 21? No. And do you know that statistics prove that 75% of all adult criminals were formerly juvenile delinquents? I'm amazed at my own ignorance. Oh, I thought about it all last night. I want to build it, Rick. Build what? Jim's youth center. Oh, that's quite a big undertaking, Deb. He wanted me to go on doing things for both of us. You told me that yourself. Sure, I know, but it takes more than just the right kind of a spirit to start something like that. It takes money. Oh, we'll raise it. We'll get everybody in town to contribute. Dad's a city manager, and he knows a lot of people. Oh, I know we can do it, Rick. <laughs> the way you look right now, you could do it all by yourself. I think it's a wonderful idea, Deb, and quite a tribute to Jim. Kind of like a, a war memorial. War memorial. 
I never thought of it like that. Oh, it's a wonderful idea. Thanks for the lift, Deb. I'll see you tomorrow. McNulty's real estate office, 11 o'clock sharp. I'll pick you up here. Right. Two after every meal relieves heartburn. I hope you've got a cure for a broken neck. Take it easy, Rick. Nobody saw me come in. If they did, it could ruin the whole play. I'm not supposed to have any brains. I only do what I'm told. Silky sent me. When did Silky start losing his mind? When he found out Tori didn't go to Havana. She ducked me at the airport. Silky thinks she's here. Read the sign. There's a rule against bringing women in this place. There's also a rule against intoxicating beverages. All right. Now look in the closet in the upper right-hand pocket of my blue suit. You'll find Tori disguised as a handkerchief. Who is it? Delivery boy. Rick Stewart? Yeah. The stuff you ordered from the drugstore. Dollar forty-five. Hey, keep the change. Thanks. Headache? Change of climate. Gets me in my sinus. Looks all right. No hard feelings, Rick. I'm just doing a job. I had to check. OK, you've checked. Now check out of here. And don't let anybody notice you. Nobody ever does. I got an ordinary face. Well, it certainly took you long enough. Does the back of my neck fascinate you, dear? Yeah. I'm just trying to decide where to break it. That's not a nice way to talk to a girl who comes clear across the country to see you. What happened to Havana? I don't know how to say no in Spanish. You kiss like you're paying off an election bet. How'd you get by Max? I made him buy us a few drinks before the plane took off. How'd you get the money to come out here? I lifted his wallet. You know, I don't think Silky pays Max very much. I had to take a bus out here. How'd you find out where we were? Max can't hold his liquor. He talks too much. Oh, stop worrying about Silky. He won't find me as long as I stick close to home. Now, stick close to home as long as I don't get lonesome. I can't take the chance on coming out here. Silky's probably got Max on my tail right now. Oh, that moron can't follow a conversation with a printed sheet. Come on, I rubbed two men together and built a nice cozy fire in the living room. Pack your things. What do you think you're doing? I'm putting you on a plane to Havana. You're not going to spoil a perfect fix now. I'm not going to spoil anything. You can play all the little games you want with that war widow. She's business on pleasure. Your kind of pleasure comes too high. Now put this on and shut up. I'm not going to Havana, Rick. You're going to Havana if you have to walk all the way.
Where do you think you're going? There's a telephone booth down at the filling station. I'd like to get a look at Silky's face when I tell him you sent for me. You're bluffing. Come down and listen. Will you try and be a good girl if I let you stick around? I always try, Rick. That's my goal, to be worthy of you. Silky wants to see you. Why? I'll give you one guess. How's your headache, Rick? I needed some fresh air. I took a drive. It was a big drive. Three hours, Max says. What's a big headache? Down with three. I thought maybe you saw Tory. Max picked me up. Ask him. I don't have my own boys tailed. We work on the honor system here. Tory's somewhere in town. Who sent for her? I'm getting awful sick of this, Silky. I'm not gaining any weight over it either. I shipped Tory to Havana. She winds up in Mission City. Who sent for her, Rick? How should I know? I told you before I'm not interested in Tory. Take it easy, Rick. Why should I? I'm out here trying to line up something big and he takes a chance on messing it up because he's got a crush on some cheap... on Tory. Rick's telling the truth. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, maybe you are. How did she know where we were going? I dropped breadcrumbs all the way out here. Forget it. Sometimes she drives me crazy. How are you getting along with Deb Clark? Great, until you bust it in. I said I'm sorry, but I'm not gonna write it on the blackboard a hundred times. Seen the girl twice, once with her father. We start looking at property tomorrow. Fast work. But don't sacrifice quality for speed. Make sure she buys the most expensive property in town. This is a big deal, Rick. If you can put it across, we may even make enough money to go honest. I'm walking on clouds already. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to go home and sleep on them. Give me a lift, Duke. Right. Rick. No hard feelings about Tory. I trust you. She's your girl, Silky. Start tailing him, Max. He's a dirty liar. Silky can't see straight when he's got Tory on his mind. You seem to have the same kind of trouble. Sick and tired of the whole two-bit setup. How'd you like to break with Silky? You think you're smart enough to operate without him? What do you think? You're not so smart, Rick. You're just lucky. I believe Mr. McNulty's expecting me. Oh, yes, Mrs. Clark. You may go right in. Thank you. Well, Deb, how are you? Fine, thank you, Mr. McNulty. Your father called me about the memorial. I think it's a great idea. Great idea. Mr. McNulty, this is Mr. Stewart. I have heard about this young man. Everybody in town knows that Jim Clark's old buddy has come back to pay us a visit. Oh, uh, Deb, here are some pictures of the estate. Uh, look them over. Say. 
Did you know my nephew, Bob McNulty? He was in Jim's outfit also. Bob McNulty? Yeah. Oh, you probably didn't know him by name. Everyone called him Fisheye. Oh, Fisheye. <laughs> yeah. Sure, I knew him. Yeah. But Jim wrote me that Fisheye had been transferred to another outfit. I didn't mean I knew him personally. Ever do any soldiering, Mr. McNulty? Paris, 1917, 530th Headquarters Company. And you know what it means to be in combat week after week, month after month, tired, wet, lonely. You get to know a lot of people you never even met. You read the other fellow's mail when you don't get any, and you, you talk for hours about his family and friends. Jim talked so much about Fisheye that I felt I knew him a lot better than most people I really do know. I understand. Have you got any water around Of here? course, son. There's a cooler in the outer office. Thank you. Excuse me, Deb. I'll be right back. Let me guess. You have trouble with the cops. Oh? The way you look at me, it feels like you're breaking a law. My name's Madeline. That's the only thing worth remembering. Now it's your turn to guess. You're from New York. How did you know? You've got Fifth Avenue written all over you. How are things in Mission City? The Undertakers are having a whale of a time. You sound bitter. What drove you out here? I read a slogan in a subway once. Go west, young man. So I went. But I haven't been able to find any young men who did. Looks like I came along just in time, hmm? Well, don't stay too long. This weather's like dope. We've got people here that have been trying to get away for 50 years, and they haven't the willpower to break the habit. We must have a long talk sometime. That sounds real promising. Oh, Rick, Mr. McNulty's going to drive us out to see some places. Fine. I'll be gone for about an hour, Miss Talbot. Keep an eye on things. Don't I always, Mr. McNulty? Now, this place seems to be ideal. I should say it is. Easy to convert and plenty of room to expand later. What's the price? $100,000. Oh, it really isn't out of line when you consider the place has a swimming pool, stables, tennis court. What do you think, Rick? I don't know, Deb. I realize this is the most expensive piece of property we have. If you care to look at something Why cheaper... Why don't we look the place over again? Give it a fair chance. Good idea. You two run along. I'll sit here and rest. We won't be long. Take your time. This bench was built for me. I know what an obstacle course feels like. Kids would love it. Oh, so do I, Rick. But don't you think it's a little too expensive? You know, Deb, people sometimes save on the wrong things. For instance, a woman will do all her own washing and then go out and spend a week's salary on a silly-looking hat. <laughs> oh, I haven't got a business head, Rick. I just want to do what's best. No expert, either. I think this is what Jim would have picked. Here. Look at it this way. Here's your house, the basement for showers and locker rooms. hundred yards back of that, are your tennis courts. And directly behind that, there's an open space here that could be converted into a, a baseball diamond. And then, of course, there's your woods for barbecues and campfires. Can't beat that kind of planning, Deb. The architect was God. It's a very beautiful thought, Rick. We better get back. Santa Claus is waiting. You mean Mr. McNulty? Well, he does look a little bit like old Saint Nick, don't you think? 
Maybe he is. He's just given us a beautiful present. Rick, I'm going to ask him to hold the estate for us. Now, wait a minute, Dan. Don't make a decision on my account. I'm a funny guy. I even like broccoli. Oh, it's exactly what we want. I'm convinced of it now. But the price, $100,000. That'll take a lot of contributions. There are a lot of women in this town, Rick, who'd rather help kids than buy silly little hats. Oh, it's been a wonderful day. It should have been. It's the last day of the year. Say, Deb, I've got an idea. Let's go out and celebrate tonight. Oh, I don't know, Rick. It's been so long since I've been out with anyone except Jim. You'll have to start meeting people someday. If only to get contributions. <sighs> You're nice, Rick. The second nicest guy you ever met. Hi there, Rick. Deb will be down in a minute. Fine. This is quite a collection. Deb's idea. Funny, the sharpshooter's medal was lost in the mail while Jim was still in the States. Deb almost got sick about it. Although it's really the least important of them all. Sure. They give those away in popcorn boxes. Cigar? No, thanks. You've been a marvelous influence on Deb, Rick. Getting her to go out, do things again? Oh, I just gave her a little start. She'll be coasting along on her own soon. With the blueprint for a gymnasium in one hand and a blank check in the other. <laughs> I only hope she doesn't finish building that youth center before I get back. I want to be on hand for the opening ceremonies. You're going away? Tonight. Just for a few days. Business. Where is everybody? In here, darling. You like it? Would I like a million dollars? You look lovely. Oh, thank you, darling. Happy New Year. Thanks. Have a good time. We will. Thank you, sir. Happy New Year! Shut up, Horace. It's too early. <laughs> Horace, hand me your glasses. Huh? Oh. Good evening. Rick Stewart. Uh, yes, Mr. Stewart. This way, please. Isn't that Deb Clark? I don't know. You got my glasses. Excuse <laughs> us, kids. Horace and I'll be right back. Come on, Angel. Deb, darling, I haven't seen you in ages. Peggy, Horace, hello. It's wonderful to have you back. But if you've been in hiding with this, I can't say I blame you a bit. Oh, this is Mr. Stewart, Mr. and Mrs. Sherman. Oh, Mr. Stewart, Jim's friend? Yes. How do you do? Hello. Horace, say hello. Hello. Jim and I used to play football together. Stanford, 38. What a ball player he was. What a guy. Horace, shut up. You look different without Jim. Of course, uh, you look a little like Jim. Hey, let me have my glasses back. Excuse us, please. Deb promised me this dance. Sure. Can't you learn to keep your big mouth shut? What did I say? I'm sorry, Rick. You must think I'm silly, but... Well, if it weren't for those constant reminders... Yes, I, I know. It's always that way. But it's not their fault, it's yours. Well, it's all a matter of perspective. They remind you of Jim, the times you had, the friends you made, and you let her get you down. I can't see it that way myself. What do you mean? Well, these memories that are making you so miserable, they were happy ones, weren't they? And you're changing them into something else. Why not save them like you did Jim's medals and let them enrich your life instead of embittering it. <laughs> Just like my Uncle Zeke, always misplacing things. Thank you. Did I ever tell you about my Uncle Zeke? Well, he was a wealthy old cattleman, but absent-minded as sin. 
One day he found a piece of rope in his hand. He scratched his head and looked at me and said, I've either found a piece of rope or lost a horse. You never told me much about yourself, Ray. There's not much to tell. You spoke of some kind of business. My uncle's not mine. He has cattle interests all over the country, and I just kind of wander around and keep an eye on him. I can't seem to settle down. It's the disease of our times. Or of our generation. How about that dance now? I put that thing down, it turns up someplace else. Hey, where'd you get that outfit? Oh, I knocked it off on my sewing machine. The first thing you know, you'll be giving this place so much class, we'll have to raise the rent. <laughs> How was Deb tonight? It's a new year. She's a new girl. You're a real tonic, Rick. Good night, Charlie. Good night. Hey, Rick, I almost forgot. Just after you left, the package came for you from the drugstore. Oh, thank you. Some bromide. <laughs> Another headache, huh? Nope. Same one all over again. Yeah. Mabel, Vermont, 81099. Well, you remembered. How could I forget? Anybody want to buy some old gold? Polish the counter clear down at the other end, dear. Who's she? Just an outraged woman who's going to cut your throat if she catches you flirting with her husband again. I'll beat it before I call the cops. Say something sweet, Angel. You may have a brain, Tori, but you must have rented it out to a medical student. Thought you were going to stay home. As long as there are men like you around, dear girls will always leave home. Why didn't you see me last night? I was busy. Busy, busy, busy. I'm getting pretty tired of this, sonny boy. While you were traipsing around with goody two-shoes last night, I was celebrating the new year by reading a book. A big, fat, boring book about big, fat, boring people. Do you think I was having a good time? No, you look like you're in mourning. What's this? It's a present for the girl. A medal. What did she do to earn it? It's part of the play. I hope falling for that girl isn't part of the play, too, Rick. Don't be silly, Tori. I wouldn't give her five minutes of my time if I didn't have to. Who are you kidding? The only babe you wouldn't make a play for is a bearded lady. You stupid little twist. Here I am beating my brains out with a bunch of corny characters trying to make enough money to break with Silky, and you keep gumming up the works. I'm sorry, Rick. What can I do to help you? Stay away from me. I mean, besides the impossible. I want that medal engraved JDC. I'll drop by your place for dinner tomorrow night and pick it up. Come early. I need somebody strong to help me mash the potatoes. Don't let anybody see you. Don't be silly. Who would notice little inconspicuous me? Did you read that case in the paper last week? What case? 
with a jealous wife cut out the girlfriend's heart and served it to her husband for breakfast. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce myself, Don Wilson. This is the part of the program where I'm supposed to pick your pockets for a very worthy cause, the milk fund. <laughs> milk for babies to grow up big and strong and play in the Rose Bowl. We were going to auction off the Rose Bowl itself, but it's just a little bit too large to get on our stage here. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we decided on the next best thing, the Rose Bowl football. What am I bid? What am I bid? Two fifty. Two fifty's been bid. Do I hear three hundred? How about three hundred dollars? I'll make it three hundred. Three hundred has been bid. Now how about five hundred? Who'll make it five hundred? Oh, I hope somebody does. This is our favorite charity. Oh, come on now. Somebody dig deep down in his heart and come up with five hundred dollars for the milk fund. Three hundred's been bid. Who'll make it five hundred? Five hundred. You've heard the bid, ladies and gentlemen. Five hundred dollars. How about seven fifty? 750? If there are no other bids right now, it's going once for $500, twice for $500, and the third and last time for $500. Will the gentleman in the rear please come up to our stage? Right up this way. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. There you are. Give it to the kids to YA, will you? Oh, they love it. They love it. Thank you a great deal. Thank you. $500 is a lot of money. I can afford it. Uncle Zeke's got a lot of cattle. Dance? I'd love to. Let's go to the bar. All right. Perry, isn't that Walter Vanderlyn? Stan, you old son of a gun. Harry Carson. Uh, Patricia. No. This is a surprise. I haven't seen you in ages. What are you doing in this neck of the woods? Rose Bowl game. I wouldn't have missed it for all the bathing beauties in Miami. <laughs> Patricia, you don't look a day over 18. Oh, you haven't changed a bit yourself. You're still the biggest liar in town. <laughs> yes, and I'm still the best dancer in the world. May I? Why, of course, man. <laughs> Uh, no more than a couple of weeks. I got stung in a bad business deal in Miami, and I have to go to New York to raise some cash. Oh. Can I cut in? Later, son. We just met. Do you believe in impulses? Well, occasionally. Let's take a spin up to Skyview. You amaze me, Mr. Stewart. Sometimes I amaze myself. This is the California I heard about. Beautiful women lounging around swimming pools. You're interested in beautiful women, aren't you, Rick? I saw you looking at that woman in the real estate office. On the contrary, she was looking at me. Haven't you noticed I have one brown eye and one blue one? Ever since I was a little girl, I always...
always thought if I tried hard enough, I could look behind my reflection. What did you think you'd see? Dormitories, baseball diamonds, gymnasiums. Rick, do you believe in impulses? Occasionally. I want to build the youth center myself. Well, you are, in a sense, Deb. No, I mean more than just helping to build it with other people's money. I want to build it all by myself with my own money. That's ridiculous. I mean, it's too expensive for one person. Oh, I can afford it. My mother left me some money when she died. Do you think it's right to hog the whole glory for yourself just because it's a war memorial for Jim? Oh, I don't know what you mean. Well, this youth center, it's bigger than Jim. It's going to mean something pretty wonderful for a lot of people, and they might like to feel that they had a part in helping it along. Oh, well, after it's all built, there'll be so much to add. Well, they can help then. It's just that I want to move on and not have to wait for contributions. Did you ask your father about this? No, but I'm sure he'll approve of the idea. Well, after you've finished, send me a picture of the place. Rick, you're not planning to leave now, are you? No reason to hang around any longer. But there is. Well, there'll be so much planning and figuring to do, and you're so good at that sort of thing. Oh, can't you manage to stay on? Well, at least until everything is finally worked out. I don't know, Deb. It's been such fun sharing things with someone again, Rick. I'll think about it. Did you check with the desk? I see. No definite date, huh? All right, Max, call it a day. Looks like Vandalin's gonna be around for a while. That's what I thought. When do we clear town? As soon as we get some dough. But the fix is off, Silky. I told you, Deb wants to do the whole thing with her own money. That's a one-way deal from her purse to McNulty safe. We couldn't make a nickel out of that with a four-cent start. You give up too easily, Rick. Remember the pitch Benny Hawkins made on that sanitarium in Chicago? It's perfect for this. Short and sweet. And we can be out of town before Vandalin has a chance to get the wrinkles out of his clothes. I don't think Deb would go for it. Well, you've talked her into everything else. You'll talk her into this. Oh, sure. I could probably sell her the Brooklyn Bridge, too, if it hadn't been sold before. What's eating you? Nothing's eating me. I don't like to play. It's too risky. Well, making a hundred grand always is. Or have you found something more practical than money? And what is it? Have you gone soft on that dame? Don't be silly. I should have known. New Year's Eve, you were falling all over. You wouldn't know love from a heartburn. That was part of the play. And fleecing her is the other part. What's holding you back? Give him a break, Silky. He's never let us down yet. Don't front for me, Duke. If he doesn't trust me, he can get himself another boy. Get this straight, Rick. I spent a lot of money on this fix. We'll take what we can get. You're going through with it hot or cold. You've got no lease on my blood supply. I'll quit any time I feel like it. Maybe you like now. I didn't say that. But you meant it. I never liked you, Rick. I only kept you around because I thought you were smart. But in this racket, you're not very smart when you start falling for a girl instead of a bankroll. You may be the slickest talker in the world, but you won't be able to fool Deb Clark very long. When she asks about your background, what are you going to tell her? That you never went to Harvard? That your old man was a two-bit thief who taught you how to roll a drunk when you were 10? Or are you going to tell her that you never made an honest living? You're good shortchanging the butcher, cheating at cards, selling phony oil wells. It won't work, Rick. In six months, you'll be back begging for a handout. When do we start? Tomorrow. 
Max will make the phone call. He'll louse it up. I got a girl staked out in the real estate office who thinks I stepped out of a dream. Good boy, Rick. I want you to handle the other half of the play, Duke. How are you going to get McNulty out of the way? It'll be a cinch. He'll be in Arcadia showing me some property. Well, here we go again. New York. What do you mean? I gave you three minutes to put on your face and get over here after I passed your office. It's taken you four. Two minutes. You ought to patent this approach. Angry? I was when I thought you'd forgotten me. That wasn't very likely, was it? You probably have girls hidden in safety deposit boxes all over the country. Only in the larger cities. How'd you like to clear out of this town? How would you like to find out your rich uncle just died? I'm leaving for New York in a couple of days. I thought you might like to be there to greet me. I haven't enough car fare to get to the airport. That's too bad, because if you did, you'd have a free ride clear to LaGuardia Field. What's the catch? Just make a little phone call for me. Sounds phony already. It isn't. But what if it were? I want 10% of whatever you make. You'll get half. We're together. I'll think about it. While you're thinking, remember Mission City for the rest of your life. What plane do I catch? 9.30 tonight. I'll follow you in a couple of days. You won't let me down, will you? If I do, it'll be nice and easy. Hello, Mrs. Clark? This is Madeline Talbert of the McNulty Realty Company. Yes, Mr. McNulty's secretary. Something came up, and I thought it best to get in touch with you immediately. One of our out-of-town salesmen, Mr. Swanson, just arrived in town with a client who wants to close a deal on Skyview. Yes, I know Mr. McNulty promised to hold it for you, Mrs. Clark. Yes, but you see, Mr. McNulty's out of town. He won't be back until late tomorrow, and this client says he'll only wait until 9.30 in the morning. He has to make the 10 o'clock train. Well, suppose I send Mr. Swanson over to see you. Yes, he's in the office right now. Fine. He'll be over in about half an hour. Happy landings. Hello? Oh, yes, Deb. Tonight? Well, what's the idea of them rushing into buying tonight? Oh. Well, I, I just didn't like the idea of them pushing you into anything. All right, I'll be right over. Don't do anything till I get there. Bye. Hello, Rick. Hello, Deb. Mr. Swanson's already here. Fine. Deb, uh, let me do the talking, will you? Mr. Swanson, this is Mr. Stewart. Glad to meet you, sir. Hello. Won't you sit down? Thank you. I abhor the idea of rushing people into a thing like this, but as a matter of fact, this sale is very important to me. As I was explaining to Mrs. Clark, this is the first big deal I've handled since I started working with Mr. McNulty. And I realize that, Mr. Swanson, but don't you think you could give us a couple more days to think it over? Well, I wish I could say yes, but this other client is ready to close. I don't think I could take the chance. Rick, it's exactly what we want. We've already made up our minds. Deb, I tried to explain to you last night why I thought you shouldn't buy Skyview with your own money. But I'm afraid I didn't tell you the most important reason. I don't understand, Rick. What, what's the reason? Well, it's this way. Your father's in politics. 
If you buy Skyview, there'd be a lot of people who'd say it was just a stunt to drum up votes for the next election. Oh, no, Rick. I, I don't want this to sound as if I were interfering, but couldn't you buy the place on the QT, so to speak? Not if the check is made out to the McNulty real estate office. Well, I could make the check out to cash, couldn't I? I suppose so. Well, then, who said I didn't have a business head? <laughs> Fine, I'll be at your house tomorrow at 8.30 to pick up the check. Then I'll have the contracts drawn up and you can put them and the cash into escrow. Rick, why can't you do all that for me? I'll make out the check tonight, then you and Mr. Swanson can take it down to the bank in the morning and do the whole thing. I don't like to carry a check of that size around with me, Deb. Well, I'll make it out to you then, and you can endorse it when you get down there. I guess that'll be all right. Hello? Oh, this is Mrs. Clark speaking. Oh, would you read it to me, please? Oh, I see. Thank you. Oh, it's a telegram from Dad. He'll be back tomorrow. Oh, just one more thing, Mrs. Clark. You'd better call the bank in the morning and tell them to verify this check. There might be some question over a check this size. Oh, I'll take care of it. Hope this doesn't get you into trouble with your other client, Mr. Swanson. Oh, it doesn't matter, Mrs. Stewart. There's a client for every minute. Well, I'd better be going now. Good night, Mr. Swanson. Good night, Mrs. Clark. Good night, Mrs. Stewart. Good night. I'd better run along, too, Deb. I'll see you at the door, Rick. up. Listen, if this is the only time that dame can spare you, she can have you. Get your suitcase. Are you taking the food home with you? Boys and I are leaving for Chicago tomorrow. I thought you might like to follow. What happened to the fix? Fix is in. A hundred grand. Oh, Rick, I'd love you if it were only half the amount. What'd you do, hypnotize the girl? She trusted me. Just a wide-eyed kid who couldn't tell a beggar from a burglar. You sound sorry. These prices, why should I be? I don't know. Rick, let's cash the check and walk out on Silky. Don't be a fool. We'll send him a real nice present next Christmas. <laughs> if you could buy a cheap horse, you'd rent your mother out as Lady Godiva. Is that so? Well, I just decided for both of us. I'll get the chicken. Turn you upside down. You dropped your keys in the hall. I called, but you'd driven away. I followed you. Thought you might need them. Deb. Shut up. You just cost us a hundred grand. Don't blame it on me. I said shut up. What will I tell Silky now? Why tell him anything? Just cash the check. Deb has to verify the check at the bank first. After what she saw tonight, she wouldn't trust me with a bent slug. Why don't you tell her that you found me outside and I had too much to drink and you were bringing me in? Deb's not a moron. Well, that's your opinion because she's nuts about you. She's not nuts about me. Oh, no? Then why was she making like a soap opera? She thinks I'm her husband's pal, and she can't believe her husband's pal would be any less of a tin god than he was. Well, then it's simple. Why don't you tell her that I was her husband's girlfriend? I inherited you, huh? No, you hate me, don't you see? I came to town to shake her down, and you found out about it, so you... No, no. 
Why not? The husband's dead, isn't he? How can she prove I wasn't his girlfriend? Deb wouldn't go for it. I told you, Jim was a tin god. Oh, she can't be that naive. Yes, she can be that naive. Naive and corny. The kind of a girl who'd save all these medals in a showcase and grieve over a stinking two-bit sharpshooter's badge lost in the mail. But you wouldn't understand that. What's the matter, Rick? You afraid if we disillusion the poor little girl, she'll die? Maybe she would. Well, I'll shop around for a good organist. Something tells me you're stuck on that social ice pick. You're crazy, Tori. I am? Convince me. Now, don't get any more silly ideas. I'm going home, try and figure out a new angle on this deal, and let me do it my way, will you? Sure, Rick. We'll do it your way. Charlie. Who is it? I'll be right down. Where? In the gym. a basketball game last night. I hope we won. Rick, why didn't you tell me about that girl? I just didn't. I wish you had. I know everything now, anyway. This arrived by messenger a few moments ago. Along with this note. Dear Mrs. Clark, Jim wasn't perfect, but in his league, 90% was failing. He gave me this medal when he was stationed in the East. I'm sure now that he's dead, he would prefer that you had it. I was going to use it to blackmail you, but your friend Rick Stewart spanked the idea out of me. You must have seen it yourself when you walked in on us. Good luck, Tori Hayward. That's stupid. Don't, Rick. They're lies, Deb. Cheap, rotten lies. She wasn't Jim's girl, she's mine. You don't have to lie for him, Rick. Oh, I know what you're thinking, that this will make me think less of him. But you're wrong. I'm glad, Rick, honestly, I am. Because all the time we've been together, I've been fighting myself, telling myself it wasn't right to fall in love again. But I did. And it feels so good to say it, Rick. I love you, I love you. I'm not going through with it, Duke. I'm walking out. What do you mean you're walking out? What is it, too early in the morning to make $100,000? I'm getting married. Anyone we know? Deb. I thought so. It was a nice day. I didn't plan it, Duke. It just happened. Doesn't it always? What about the check? I'll explain to Deb later. Sorry, Duke. Oh, that's all right. I just didn't know there was that much love left in the world. Silky's not going to like this. Silky's not going to know if you'll help me. Haven't I just given you my share of $100,000? Isn't that enough? When Silky calls, stall him. Tell him the fix is off until tomorrow. That'll give me a chance to clear town. You have as much chance of survival as a fan dance with a broken arm. Where are you going? To the Belgian Congo? Catch a train this afternoon for Frisco. Be married there and board the Clipper for Honolulu. What about Tori? 
She can go back and ruin Silky's life. You really think it'll work, Rick? I'll make it work. Well, I may make you assistant city manager. Let me know. I may want to look you up for a fix someday. <laughs> How do you like the new shade of lipstick? I was in the beauty parlor. I saw the car and I needed to lift home. I'll drop you by a cab stand. You in a hurry? We're clearing out of town. Rich or honest? The whole deal went sour, thanks to you. This little letter of yours and the metal broke her up so badly, she canceled the war memorial. You're kidding, Rick. I told you to let me handle it my way. Anyway, Silky's plenty hot at me for curdling the fixed. I'm gonna have to start being a good boy for a while. Meaning? Meaning I won't be seeing you. You can drive me home first. We'll have a nice long chat. I haven't got much time. My train leaves at 4-5. That gives us exactly an hour to say goodbye in. Sorry to be so abrupt, Tori, but I have to get right back. Natch! Goodbye, Rick. Tori! Give me those keys. Keys. It's not a drink in the house and I buy bread. I want those keys, Tori. You're wonderful when you're mad. You're so full of adrenaline. I'm warning you. Come and get them. I love being trapped. I don't want to play games. You sure, Rick? Let's play True Confessions. You want to make one? Hand them over, Tori. Sure I will in Chicago, although I've always liked Honolulu better. It's such a wonderful place for a honeymoon. I was in the beauty shop when the bride came in. She wants to come to you freshly waved. All right, Tori, you've had your laughs. Now give me those keys. Who's that? Hang around. This is going to be more fun than laughing. Come in. Rick. Deb, what are you doing here? I sent her. I could kill you, Tori. Rick, what's the matter? Nothing's the matter, honey. I just called you over for a little heart-to-heart -heart talk. Would you be embarrassed if we talked about you? Deb, get out of here. I'll meet you in the car. Don't be impolite. I just started talking. Let me tell you a few things about Rick every young bride should know. Put that gun down, Tori. You don't know how to play rough. A few tears in your eyes, and you think you can get any man you wave a wet handkerchief at. But you don't fool me for a minute with that phony war widow act. You cheap. Deb. She just bumped her head. Maybe it knocked some brains in it. Just look at her, Rick. Don't handle her. I think I still remember how to use one of these things. Let me see. There's four bullets in here in case you're stubborn after the first one. Or is it five? It's such a long time since I murdered my mother. You're crazy, Tori. Put on a gun. Give me a reason. We can settle this some other way. I'll settle for marriage, will you? Here's your head, Tori. You can have Silky. If I wanted Silky, I could have married him a long time ago. Oh, no, Rick. I gave up everything for you. You're not going to run out on me now. We both come from the same kind of jungle. It's either you and me or nothing at all. Okay, baby. You win. It's you and me. All the way. All the way. To Honolulu and back. How about a kiss, Mrs. Stewart? That was certainly a fast honeymoon. to get up. We won't be a minute. It was an accident. Yeah, the cars drive awful fast through here. What'd you do? Knock the clock, Dame Cole, too? Tori wasn't any good, Silky. I liked her. Listen, Silky. Listen to me. Listen to you. That's an idea. Max, how would you like to hear a first-class grifter talk his way out of a spot? Think of the drama. He's got three minutes before his chest lights up. Three shots for a dime. Go ahead, Rick. You idiot. Listen to how it's done, Max. That's finessed. 
You're so used to second-rate thinking, you wouldn't know something big if it came along. You want to take over this town? You want to frame the Clark girl? Right under your stupid nose is the biggest frame of all murder. But you got a grudge. The world isn't full enough of dames. You're going to be stuck on a dead one and throw away a city. You pin a murder rap on the Clark, Damon. You got this joint sewed up for a lifetime. Why would the girl want to kill Tory? <laughs> it's a little difficult to think under these conditions. You got another 30 seconds. What's the motive? Blackmail. Tory was Jim's girlfriend while he was in the army. He wrote her some letters. She threatened to let the whole town in unless Deb paid off. Deb tried to stop her. There was an argument, and she was killed. What happens when the girl wakes up? She could say it was an accident. I saw it. It was murder. It'll work. Get up. There's a phone down at the gas station. I'll call Owens and get him out here. I'll walk down with you. Take care of the gun, Max. I'll get some change. Thanks. Operator, give me Sycamore, 98102. Hello, Mr. Owens, this is Rick. Look, something terrible just happened. No, I can't tell you about it over the phone. It's about Deb. Meet me right away at Ocean Drive, 2265. Right. It's all set. Don't wait too long, but don't make it look phony either. I'll handle it. You just come through with your end. What happened, Rick? You better come inside. Deb. Deb. She'll be all right. She tripped running out. Running out? Yeah, she didn't know what she was doing. She just dropped the gun and ran. Rick, is she dead? Yeah. The woman was blackmailing Deb. I suppose we should have told you. She was Jim's girlfriend while he was in the army. She threatened to start a scandal unless Deb paid off. Rick, what are we going to do? We'll think of something. Sorry, we didn't know anybody was here. Hey, what's going on? Who are you? Private investigators. This is the one we've been after, but I guess we're a little too late. Who's the other dame? My daughter. She's out cold. Is she killer? We just got here ourselves. Have you called the cops? Not yet. You better call them. But we don't know what happened. They'll find out. Wait a minute. What did you want the other girl for? Blackmail. Every kind in the books. Well, Deb never hurt anybody in her life. What I mean is this could all be a big mistake, but if you call the police, they'd be sure to arrest her. There's no other way. There must be another way. If that girl's a blackmailer, she must have had dozens of enemies. Any one of them could have done it. Are you implying that this girl was framed? Why not? With that kind of circumstantial evidence, she wouldn't stand a chance. If you could just forget you ever saw us... That's suppressing evidence. Give us a break. We'll get the girl out of the way. No one will ever know. But we'd be accessories. Mr. Owens is city manager. I'm sure he'd cover for you. I'll do anything to keep my daughter from having to go through this. Will you help us? Well, you're putting us in a tough spot, Mr. Owens. If we did, I'd have to have some sort of guarantee that you'd stick by us. I'd make it worth your while. Oh. Deb. Dad. Deb, are you all right? Oh, I, I think so. Dad, that girl. Did I? Don't get excited, Deb. Things are going to be all right. But the gun went off. I heard it. Deb, please. Rick, did I kill her? Did I? I can't remember. Take I... it easy, miss. Nothing's going to happen to you. No. No, I couldn't have. Rick, tell me the truth. Did I kill her? Did I? No. It was an accident. She shot herself. This whole thing's a frame. We're a bunch of grifters, high-class con men. Now you did. Yeah, grab him. Mr. Owens, did you call us? No. He's the one that told me to call you. 
Better phone the morgue Higgins, take them all down to the station. I'll prefer charges later. Him too? Yeah. Him too. Wait a minute. It wouldn't work, Deb. Just cross this week out of your life. Forget it ever happened. Oh, Frank, I can't. He never belonged in this business in the first place. 